Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This program is made possible thanks to the generosity of our listeners. Show your support at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. This week on Meet and 3, we bring you a sensational episode where each story hones in on one of the four senses that accompanies taste. Many of the smells that we uh, encounter in everyday life actually exist out there in the cosmos. Food carries all these culturally specific meanings. The fact that, you know, when you see an apple, it's not just an apple, right? I was mostly interested in thinking about what knobs ASMR was pulling on, maybe, or how we could explain it from a psychological or emotional or evolutionary standpoint. Tune in to Meat and 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. We're recording uh, remotely on Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. We'll be talking about fall releases and what we're drinking for fall with uh, our crew here. So everyone introduce themselves. Start with Terrence. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is uh, Terrence Sullivan. I'm a brand manager at Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Been here 26 years, started as a graveyard brewer, uh, Pretty much worked in most facets of the brewery um, on the sensory department. That is one of my favorites. Uh, so I'm here to talk about beer, talk about Sierra Nevada. All right, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. And Zach? Hi, how's it going, guys? I'm Zach Mack. I'm the owner of Alphabet City Beer Co. in the East Village in New York City. And I dabble in some beer writing as well. Great, man. Thanks for coming out. And uh, Ted? Hi, I'm Ted Kenny. I'm the owner of uh, Top Hops Beer Shop on the Lower East Side, uh, and uh, just looking forward to a great convo. That's great. So, you know, it's, it's fall, and uh, throughout everything in the last eight months, we're trying to stay positive and, and talk about, you know, the, the, the good things in life, and, including uh, beer. Uh, and fall is my favorite time uh, for beer, you know, whether it's dark beers, Oktoberfest, fresh hop beers, and... Um, Luckily, we got to talk with Terrence uh, from Sierra Nevada. So you guys have a couple uh, fall releases out. So Terrence, tell us what, what's out right now and a little bit about your role in Sierra Nevada because we really respect that organization. We've had Ken Grossman and Brian Grossman on in the past. Yeah, so um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my role first. Um, so uh, mainly I, I work with a lot of small brands. I mean, I, I cover most everything I'm on. Uh, you know, I mentioned that I was I do a lot of sensory stuff. Uh, so I'm on a lot of the new product development uh, panels. Um, so kind of discussing, even though, you know, other people manage those those areas, if it was something like a seasonal, new seasonal release or a new beer that's coming out per year. Um, so, I, so I do a lot of that stuff. My main focus, though, is on our small brands. And we're trying to, you know, with the situation that's going on now, uh, trying to expand our e-commerce 
market uh, in in beer. We've never really done that before um, as a company. So we started doing that when COVID kind of hit. Um, so trying to trying to manage that, uh, you know, talking about doing four pack, 16 ounces, you know, like all the cool kids are doing these days. So trying to do some of that stuff. And, and hopefully a lot of those beers will become experimental beer, or start as experimental beers and move up and maybe fill a category where they become a new seasonal or become a new launch. Um, so, you know, I, I also manage one of our, we have a uh, kind of a private club, uh, so to say it's 450 members called the Alpha Hop Society, mainly focuses in barrel aged beers. Uh, and then we throw a, a party, obviously we weren't doing it this year, but, um, you know, a, a party around the releases uh, for our members. Uh, a lot of them are located in Calif- uh, Chico, California, and then our Mills River, uh, North Carolina facility. And we also have a tasting room down in Berkeley. So we, we do that. Uh, some of the beers that are out right now, we're going to be tasting the Oktoberfest and then uh, the Dankful IPA, uh, which is a new year-round beer um, that we we presented um, just just recently. September, I think, was the release date, late late August. Um, so it's an IPA, and its main focus is to give back, uh, give back to community, um, you know, we, we realize uh, this this time of need right now, uh, you know, um, you know, you talk about social equality, economics, uh, environmental protection. That's what this beer is going to do. Um, so over the course of of a year, we'll be do- donating to several different nonprofits a um, uh, million dollars uh, during that time. And, and actually, uh, our we've already uh, decided on our first donation, and that's for uh, World Central Kitchen. Um, so we're uh, donating proceeds from that beer sales uh, to that, which I think is really cool, you know. Um, well, that's great. Is, that's uh, Jose Andre's uh, uh, charitable. Yeah, group, yeah. Right? And we, we actually, we worked with him um a uh, couple years ago, 2018, when we had those disastrous fires in Paradise, California, World Central Kitchen uh, came around the Chico area. Uh, they used our kitchen actually for um, for one of the uh, spots to go get Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and uh, actually, Ken Grossman, the owner of Sierra Nevada, um, we were we were just starting to kind of put together his old brew house when the fires hit. Um, and we, we pivoted and, uh, you know, went 360 degrees and used his original kettle that, uh, he started in 1980 with, uh, to boil potatoes, uh, for the mashed potatoes, uh, that, that we served in that meal. And one of the coolest things is I got to sit down and, uh, have a couple beers, uh, uh, with Jose Andreas, um, have a couple of our barrel age beers. He was, well, man. Yeah, he could. He couldn't believe he was at a brewery and we weren't serving beer because we didn't want, uh, uh, you know, we didn't didn't want people to just center on Sierra Nevada to get a meal. And so he he grabbed my shoulder and said, "Hey, can we go drink some beer?" And so I took him upstairs and him and I had some beers. I didn't even know who the hell he was uh, until he kind of told me, and I'm like, "Oh shit! Now I know who you are." So so it was great, but. Anyways, so so those two beers and, and this time of the year too, Celebration Ale is uh, we're right uh, just now starting to distribute it. So as you start to see Oktoberfest leave the shelves, you'll see our Celebration Ale come come onto the shelves. That's great, and I, you've got quite an interesting job as well. Um, I want to just jump around a little bit before we get into that too much. Um, let's just talk about the spirit of Oktoberfest because that's going to be our first beer. Um, first, let's just ask uh, Ted at Top Hops. How are things a little different for you, you know, um, with with COVID and everything? Do you have a lot of other fall fall beers in or anything? Um, well, this year everything's different. We uh, we only had, you know, we're we're doing outdoor seating only. We didn't go with the indoor seating of twenty five percent. It just didn't really uh, make a lot of sense. But uh, as Terrence was saying, we're you know making a shift towards you know, e commerce ourselves. And that's what we're using our indoors for right now. And we had a lot of people that were interested in doing Oktoberfests um, at their houses. We had some people that were doing um, 
they were, you know, just having an Oktoberfest with their friends. But then we had a lot of corporate uh, customers of ours that, that uh, wanted to do so, some stuff with their clients. And so they, they had us ship uh, four packs and six packs of uh, Oktoberfest um, mixed, you know, mixed packs out to everybody so they could do virtual uh, tastings and, you know, have virtual Oktoberfest. Yeah. And Zach, what about um, what's going on with Alphabet City Beer Co.? Oh, very similar to Ted. What he said, we are, you know, we're kind of feels almost rote at this point, even though things seem to, nothing's changing, but everything's changing every day. Um, we also decided that it wasn't going to be worth us to try to set up the space to do the limited access indoor dining, not least because we're concerned about the safety of our staff and our customers, but also because it seemed like a hefty investment for something that we didn't feel confident would be paying ourselves back much money in the long run, especially considering I'm not sure how long the offer to allow people inside the last. So we're instead focusing on similar to what Ted was saying, we're doing more, uh, we're focusing on building up our outdoor seating because we have a decent amount of space to work with there. And the, what sounds like the go ahead from the city government to have that kind of be the norm for the next couple of couple of years. Uh, and we are kind of focusing on the kind of, we, we've always had the retail portion of the shop that we were able to lean into when everything started, but now we've kind of honed in our, uh, our we've kind of, perfected our shipping game and we're doing more and more things like Ted said where we're doing virtual Oktoberfests for companies that might be doing uh, their own uh, social networking events that they can't do on site anymore we're kind of we're helping them take it virtual so we've kind of started focusing on that sort of thing and hoping you know you know you know hopefully that there's nothing too crazy around the bend to uh, to kind of throw a wrench in the works that we've kind of got a system established that can kind of keep us going for a little time here. Yeah. So Terrence, um, so Sierra Nevada has created a very interesting virtual Oktoberfest. So it's not like watching TV, like like some virtual things are, and it's not just a Zoom. You actually have like a house party kit, don't you? Yeah, we did. Uh, we did several different um, kind of iterations of it. Uh, you know, you could you could you could get the whole shebang, which was you know tablecloths and banners and. Um, uh, you know, mugs, hats. Uh, so it, it was really a, a kind of a party in a box, so to say. And, uh, and I think it, it, it's great, you know, um, listening to Ted and, and Zach, cause it, that's, that's one of the things is, has been so cool. Well, not cool about all this cause it sucks, but, um, but, but how people have really kind of pivoted and, uh, and really started to kind of like think outside the box and, and, you know, and I think consumers are digging it, you know, um, you know, our, our, our thing was we, we put on an Oktoberfest that we thought was one of the best in, in the nation. Um, and we weren't able to do that. It was like a two weekend uh, event that we would put on every year and we'd have thousands of people uh, in both our locations and, you know, live bands and all that kind of stuff. And so what can we do to kind of, at least let everybody kind of enjoy, you know, a great, a great beer, a great time of the year. You know, like you said, fall is just, yeah, I, I agree. It's beer drinking time. And, and, you know, I, I, I love the fact that um, you can, re, re, you know, drink multiple different styles of beers. Obviously Oktoberfest is a great style to drink that, you know, full body maltiness that uh, Oktoberfest styles, um, you know, trip contribute to, uh, to the season, you know, right? So yeah, so I'm taking the advice from your 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 website, your Oktoberfest site, Sierra Nevada. I I went on the yodeling lessons. <laughs> and uh-huh. I can do ah 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 That was pretty cool. You actually have a person giving yodeling lessons, and you yep. got a recipe for. I know it as sauerbraten, but it's pot roast <laughs> and right. uh, spetzel noodles. So. Um, that's what's going on in my house this weekend, but, uh, let's talk about the beer. Let's talk about the Oktoberfest. Cause like Zach, you said that, um, you look forward to the Sierra Nevada Oktoberfest every year. I do. Honestly, it's one of those things that there's, only, there, I have to say this too, and I'm, I'm jumping the horse a little bit here, but things like celebration and things like the, the rival of that is something that still gets me excited for something that comes around every year. Uh, Oktoberfest always gets me going because, the virtual collaboration that those guys have done in the past that, that Sierra Nevada has always pulled off always makes it 
somehow able to one up itself from the previous year. It just seems like either my memory is fooling me or it's going to my old age. But I'm, I, I find myself enjoying it every year, and it's an easy sell to customers because I find myself enjoying it so much. So I always kind of I look forward to it, and it's an easy sell because people know the brand, and it's kind of a perfect seasonal that I think speaks to more people than um, than brewers realize, or maybe they're getting wise to that now. But I, I really do. I love every year. It's one of the, my first uh, Oktoberfest I crack, and I get very excited about it. Terrence, can you tell us the the pl- profile of Sierra Nevada Oktoberfest because it it, it it's very lager like. Yeah, it's uh you know it it is uh you know a a, a, a Martzen style. Um, this year, you know, Zach was pointing out that uh, we've done collaborations in uh, the last few years uh, with di- different German breweries um, to kind of you know. A little bit is is kind of fun collaborations. You know, we've done it with Vine Stefan, Regula, um, uh, Bitburger. Um, so Mars Marsbrow is is to name a few of the breweries that we've worked with, and and it's just been really great fun because they've done a lot of stuff too, where they'll they'll make uh, hoppy hoppy beers uh, in Germany as as a collaboration with us. So it's been really fun. This year with, with COVID, we actually, you know, decided, you know, we're not going to be able to travel. We're not going to be able to go to Germany. Um, why don't we just take some of the skills that we learned over the last uh, five years and uh, put them together and have our brewers kind of scratch their head and make uh, make their own Oktoberfest. So, so it features, you know, some two-row pale malt as usual. Uh, it's got Vienna and Munich malts in it, which give it a nice, it, to me, a biscuity, bready type of characteristic. And, you know, generally speaking, Sierra Nevada beers, even if they are lagers, uh, they're going to be a little bit more on the higher hop side. Um, so you'd find our Oktoberfest to uh, have a little bit more of that kind of traditional German spicy hop characteristic. So we're using Spalter and uh, Spalter Select hops in this, and then true traditional uh, Weinsteffen lager yeast um, that, that, you know, accentuates that bready character. But definitely the hops have that kind of European uh, noble hop characteristic, a little background spiciness uh, to the beer. Um, and I, I just find this beer just, just, Great drink, especially coming out of, you know, the summer months. I like more of a, a crisp lager uh, during those hot summer days where uh, this has a little bit uh, more backbone, a little bit more to chew on uh, that you should find in a, in a true uh, Oktoberfest style beer. Terrence, for, for the team that works on these specialty beers, when did the recipe and the sourcing for this Oktoberfest start? They're usually kind of uh, actually, uh, you know, every year um, uh, because it's changed a little bit over over the years. Um, Our our team in Mills River, um, so Scott Jennings is is our uh, used to be our brewmaster um, in Mills River, and now he's he's moved back into uh, the innovation team, which I'm really excited about because uh, that dude can formulate some recipes like no other person. Um, so, so he, he's always worked with our Oktoberfest, uh, and every year we do a, um, uh, an Oktoberfest in May, um, that, that we do, we do like a little, uh, festival. It's almost like Christmas in July, but it's Oktoberfest in May. And so it's always our pilot brew and we put on a little, obviously we didn't do it this year, but we put on a little small party and ask people to dress up in their Oktoberfest garb. And uh, so it's usually in May. Um, and so that's that's our first recipe that kind of comes out the door. And then they'll do a little bit of fine tuning and honing of the beer uh, in early June. And then by July, they're brewing it and getting ready. We usually release it about the first week of uh, August. So um, which is it blows people's minds out here in California whenever it's uh, it's it's hotter than hell and uh, and and we got a Oktoberfest coming out in August, but I look forward to it every every time. So yeah, it definitely seems that over the years the American Oktoberfest keep coming out earlier, but we understand the traditions and uh, there's a lot to talk about. But Ted, I wanted to ask you. Um, I know New York City craft brewers 
number of them put out fest beers and fall beers. Are there any uh, New York City uh, beers that you're featuring for fall that you want to mention? Um, let's see. Well, the New York the the, the Oktoberfest that I that I really like this year it wasn't in New York City. It was a Vermont one from Zero Gravity. That one was delicious. Um, and the uh, I'm trying to think of because uh, the the <laughs> You know, the, most of the New York guys are, are doing a lot of the, you know, they're still doing all the double IPAs and everything all the time. Um, I think you stumped me there, Jimmy. I don't think I have one. From <laughs> That's okay. I'm just trying to set you up, give you a, yeah, give you a softball, my friend. <laughs> um, but tell me about Top Ops because it's, it's fall for you, you know. Um, you're at Essex Market. What are the dynamics of, that's an interesting place because it's like a supermarket market with a lot of history. But people can go inside and shop, but can they also get a pint of beer and drink it inside the market? Well, in, in, uh, in regular times, yes, they can. Um, it, uh, so the, the, the Essex market has been around for over 80 years. It was, uh, it was a, a brainchild of Fiorello, Fiorello LaGuardia uh, in order to try to uh, increase better sanitation on the streets and get the uh, push carts off the streets. Um, 80 years ago, and so it was home to a, to a, it was actually it used to be twice as big uh, back then, and it was home to um, about 80 or 90 um, vendors. And now we've got about 40 vendors. We moved into a new uh, new location last year on the south side of Delancey in Essex, uh, and it's fantastic. We've got uh, whole animal butchers, uh, fishmongers. Two great cheesemongers. In addition to those two great cheesemongers, there's a vegan cheesemonger. There's about 12 to 14 um, uh, prepared food stalls uh, and one great beer bar. And uh, we, we carry about 200 different brands of beer there that are available to take away so people can shop for the beer when they're shopping for their – there's green grocers in there as well. So people can shop for the beer while they're shopping for their – daily bread, for, let's say, but the, um, and then if they want to stop it, before COVID, they could stop and have a, uh, a beer there. Now it's, there's 25% indoor dining, but because this is a market, they're not really sure how that works because of the, it's 25%, but a maximum of 50 people were all individually owned. So it's, it's, uh, you know, we, we don't, we're we're a uh, we're a square peg uh, full of round holes out there, so it's that that's been uh, the good thing was the market was open during the entire uh, pandemic, um, but the the city has been uh, a little bit a little bit slower with us as far as what they're allowing for everyone to do. Um, we do have outdoor seating now out there. We're hoping to um, have indoor seating very soon. Yeah. Oh, that's great, man. Um, you guys have been an important part of the Lower East Side for a while. And um, Zach, and, and shout outs for any uh, fall beers that, that you're selling at Alphabet City Beer Co. I'm glad you came to me without second because I was stumped for second there, too. Um, <laughs> we, we had it's funny because everything's so different. Fall, I almost forget it was fall this year with the way things have been progressing. But we did. We had quite a few good things this year that I, I was excited to see opened up into the market. Um and I think a, a bunch of different things that like we would always get something like KCBC's Oktoberfest. Um, it's a great beer. I look forward to that one every year as well. And people seem to really appreciate it this year, but also getting stuff in from, from breweries. We got fall from Maine beer co. Uh, and that was really, really nice to see up on draft. Um, it's a different game. Like Ted was saying, it's hard to pour some of the stuff that kind of becomes in vogue this season because it doesn't feel right giving someone, you know, like a, 10%, 11% beer um, in the context that we're in. Um, uh, so we've been selling a lot of more of that in package to go. Um, but that hasn't changed the fact that we have a bunch of really good fall stuff up on the shelf. Um, we've been we've been working a lot with, I feel like lately, the the focus on, on getting in as many of the people you like to work with locally as possible has been really well rewarded. We're getting tons of great stuff from Threes. The Volition, their dark lager has been fantastic. And I feel like seasonally that's really spoken to people. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a fun 
season to kind of reacquaint yourself with a market that's kind of been turned on its head and it's not, you know, under the best of circumstances, but it is, uh, it's been a learning experience. And what have you been doing? You have a new website. What does e-commerce mean to you at your store? Are you doing deliveries? Are people ordering in advance and picking up? Kind of all of the above, actually. The The site that we signed on with is, is called Bev, B-E-V-V, and they allow us to ship nationally as well as fulfill uh, deliveries within the five boroughs and locally and uh, pick up orders. So you can kind of do all of it depending on where you are. Um, you know, obviously we can't ship to every state, but we can ship to a good chunk of them. And this has helped us expand our business when we've needed to do it most. So, uh, but it's been also great because in the very beginning, it's changed a bit since um, people have been more willing to go outside uh, in the last few months, but we were doing a ton and we still are seeing a ton of local delivery and a ton of pickup, um, but also just an obscene amount of national shipping. So it's been great for us to kind of, to have that opportunity to, to, to fulfill orders when people are becoming more comfortable shopping for beer in a, in a more digital setting. And what, what are the people ordering? Like, I don't know, whatever state someone's ordering from, are they trying to get New York city, New York city made beers? I would say exclusively the best selling stuff is the local product. So we're shipping, you know, any given day I see orders coming in from Florida, California, and it's almost exclusively the stuff that they can't get outside of the state. So packing boxes full of a lot of KCBC and other half and threes. Uh, and it's actually gone pretty well for us the last few months, um, seeing the you know, increased availability from these local producers, but also increased demand because people who, you know, will never, you know, who won't be able to come over here to get it are, are now able to because we are available online. So um, it's been interesting to see how quickly it took off. And I think in the first month when we signed up in February, when we had a stroke of majorly dumb luck, uh, and we started this, it was about 2% of our sales. And then over the course of the pandemic, it became closer to 45%, close to 50. So uh, for retail sales, which is saying a lot. So, um, you know, it always helps when you have the coveted beers there to help push things through fast. But we're seeing some stuff that, you know, that that isn't as like highly regarded sexy brands that you would find uh, sought for online still moving out the door very, very quickly. So it's it's cool to be able to see what the online market has done to to push certain things out and make more of a, a name for these breweries that, you know, would never be distributed in these other States uh, in a retail setting um, pushing through online. So last time I was in your store was probably late spring. And I know you had totally pivoted um, to, to a, a, like a retail market. And, I, and it seemed like you spent a lot of time cutting cheese and wrapping it. Um, are you still selling that much food? You had cheese and bread and vegetables. Oh, Jack Many Trades. Yeah, I learned a lot about my own cheese counter in that in that two month period. Um, we are we are selling a ton of the cheese and the specialty products. Uh, unfortunately, we saw a huge drop off. We did pick up a lot of fresh produce for the middle of the the pandemic, or the very beginning of the pandemic, I should say, uh, when it was becoming harder to justify going to the grocery store for a simple thing. So we had stocked up on avocados and garlic and and you know some fresh produce products like tomatoes and. Um, Unfortunately, that dropped off precipitously as summer started and people, I think, felt more comfortable going back into the markets and the numbers started coming down. Um, but that's not to say that when winter comes back, we won't start picking up certain things that people have been asking for. Um, but certainly things that you can't get at your corner uh, grocery store, like your specialty cheeses and meats and things like that, that we've been uh, actually diversifying our selection of. Those have been flying out the door more than they even used to. And we have people who've become rapidly fanatical about how much they want their uh, imported Australian feta um, because it's just the simple comforts times like this. You want to be able to go home and enjoy yourself on the couch in a way you can't really go out to a restaurant and do anymore. So we're kind of, we're happy to fulfill that and we're, we're not slowing down our options for, for those offerings anytime soon. Well, that, that should be my virtual Oktoberfest besides the pot roast <laughs> and the spetzel from on the, the Sierra Nevada website, I should also get some funky cheese too, you know? Right. Hey, Zach, Zach you're going to have to send me a link because I, I have some buddies out here and, and these three guys, they must order, I'd say they order about $300 worth of beer about every two weeks. And uh, they're constantly looking for uh, something new and something different that they want to try. So <laughs> you're going to This is my pleasure. That. Send me that link. Yeah, I mean these these guys are nuts. Um, it's really you know I I actually so like listening uh, to all this is is how 
this e-commerce thing has changed. Um, and I, I read an article, article just recently, uh, Beer Business Daily, and uh, I think they were quoting um, someone at InBev talking about e-commerce and how they were saying that the route e-commerce is taking right now uh, was projected to be about five years from now is where we are right now. So since COVID hit, uh, it's accelerated that fast uh, where we're at the, about the five year mark of what they predicted e-commerce would look like. So I think one of the, one of the hottest startups right now is called Instamart. It's basically helping all these grocery chains help them since March, you know, jump on the online ordering. It's pretty wild. You guys, this is we're off to a great start. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. All of us at HRN have been keeping busy, despite working and recording from home. This fall, we're proud to announce new shows on the network that each bring important and enlightening stories to listeners around the world. While the world is in turmoil and the future of our country is uncertain, there are certain constants that help keep us going. For us, food and storytelling are essential. While we can't come together in person, food podcasts from HRN provide a virtual table we can all gather around. Bringing exceptional stories to your ears and keeping you informed on the ever-changing political and environmental issues of our time is integral to our mission. At a time when the world around us is rapidly changing, HRN is committed to being here for our listening community, and we need you to be here for us. Join our table and help ensure the future of food radio by becoming a member of HRN. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate to make a contribution. Check out the latest additions to our lineup while you're there. You can see all of our series at heritageradionetwork.org slash new show. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. It's that time of year. Become a member, heritageradionetwork.org. We're a nonprofit radio network with over 30 shows about food, farming, cocktails, and uh, a lot of good social causes as well. So check us out, heritageradionetwork.org. So we're talking about fall beers, but in particular, uh, two of the Sierra Nevada releases, the Oktoberfest, and now we're going to talk about the Dankful IPA. Um, with Terrence Sullivan, and we also have Zach Mack uh, from Alphabet City Beer Co. and and Ted from uh, Top Ops in Essex Market. Um, Terrence, so tell us about the Dankful IPA. Um, we know that you guys have have been behind some really important and um, you know generous projects like the Resilience IPA. Um, tell us about Dankful IPA, but first of all, tell us about the fires. In in your part of California, man, it's it's nuts. What what have you been going through? Yeah, we're um, we're we're uh, pretty much, you know, we've we've been in, you know, this this haze of smoke, and uh, now we're you know kind of kind kind of seeing the light of day. But um, it got it got pretty bad, you know. It wasn't. You know, right where we're at in Chico is is not quite um, what it was a few years ago when we had the fires uh, in Paradise, um, but but it got pretty scary. You know, it was uh, it was right in that same community. I think all of Northern California is uh, suffering. Um, the whole West Coast, you know, um, you know, and that resilience project that was uh, that was awesome and. Uh, and you know we're 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 finally we've had some kind of uh, you know good weather or favorable weather. Um, you know this morning they're even saying that uh, we're we're in a, in a couple days of high wind, and that's that's the thing. It's been so dry um, out here that um, 
you know, all, all it takes is uh, a little mistake or something bad happened that uh, just, you know, can uh, can ruin many lives. So, but uh, but we've been hanging in there, and um, I think I missed missed what your your. No, other we're gonna part jump. Was. Okay, so about, <laughs> about the the all the things that are happening in the world. But so Dankful IPA, you know, you've got a mission. You guys are gonna donate a, a million dollars to different charities. Is this based on COVID? Is this based on uh, fires? You know, it, it you know it it kind of it came out uh, when you know when COVID hit and things were getting strange and things were getting weird and uh, and we really wanted to kind of uh, send a message, you know that uh, that that we're there, we're there to help out, and um, so. Uh, company wise, we kind of sat down and kind of figured out, you know, obviously we're a beer company and we produce beer. Uh, we speak through our beer. Um, so what better way than to, uh, you know, launch um, something that, you know, a, a style that we're known for a West Coast IPA, very hoppy um, and, and use the proceeds for that to uh, kind of you know, speak our voice and, uh, and, and tell people, um, what, what we like to support as, as nonprofits. And so we've actually, uh, internally as a company too, we've, uh, we've, we've changed a little bit, you know, we've, we've started a, a little group at the brewery that, uh, will look at different nonprofits and kind of guide our contributions, um, uh, with, you know, our employees voice, uh, so to say. So it's, it's been a pretty cool thing. And, and yeah, a lot of it is, um, COVID related, you know, um, I think everybody, if you, if you're not, if your eyes aren't open and, and your ears aren't, um, um, shit's changing. Right. And yeah, uh, man, eight months and this, this is, there's nothing new about it now. This is how it is. Hey, yep. let's ask about the dank the dankful IP. I'm drinking it now. In fact, I already drank it. Listen to my can. I already put that can down. But um, Terrence, what what other Sierra Nevada beers is this dankful IPA most like? Because you know, uh, honestly, it's a, it's 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 a little bit like. Um, a discontinued brand that we did. Um, and I, I would say it's a lot like, it's a lot like hop hunter. Uh, it maybe doesn't have quite the same hop profile. Um, hop hunter had, um, uh, some hop oils or fresh distilled hop oils from the field. Uh, this one doesn't, but this one has, it has seven different hop varieties in it. And, it, you know, I'll name them off. It's uh, Columbus, Chinook, Mosaic, Equinot, Nelson Sauvin, uh, Idaho Seven, and Zappa Hop, um, which for me, Zappa Hop is the one that kind of delivers uh, the dankiness on this beer because uh, I do get a lot of hop dank. Um, it's definitely just super aromatic. Um, it is a West Coast style IPA, um, although we, we brought the bitterness down. Uh, so it would fit in a little bit more with kind of East meets West style, I would say, you know, 55 IBUs at 7.4% um, alcohol. Um, but the one thing it's, you know, it kind of finishes dry um, to me. It's got some caramelized malts in it, which we use. We, a lot of our old school IPAs are kind of uh, featuring caramel malts, which is a little different than what, what you would, you would find in today's IPAs. Um, you know, Ken Grossman was always about balanced IPAs. So it's got to have a little bit of maltiness to it, uh, to, to go with that bitterness and go with the hop characteristics. But if you'll note on the back end of this beer, it's got a little bit of a spice and that's, uh, rye malt. We use a little bit of rye malt in this, uh, about, uh, six, six, 7% rye malt in it. Um, so it adds a little, little, um, like I like to say, a little snap at the back end. No, it's great. So let's talk about language of beer. And maybe you go first, Terrence, and then, then Zach or Ted. Um, when I hear Oktoberfest, 
a, a lot of these these style names to me can get lost um, in bad beers or or you know. But when I have your Oktoberfest, Sierra Nevada, it, it it's a lager with backbone, and I do love that style of fest beer. Now, when you say dank, also I get confused, <laughs> you know, especially when I think about marijuana or something else. But right. dank, how would you describe the the flavor or aroma of dank in an IPA? Yeah, a lot a lot of the the flavor aspects I get like a real resinous. Um, so it's kind of it's almost chewy. You can real kind of kind of feel the stickiness of the hop oils uh, on your palate uh aroma aroma wise it can kind of vary like i wouldn't say this this beer particularly has um any one kind of characteristics that that really uh shines out you know it's not it's you can't say it's like oh tropical fruit you know you get some notes of tropical fruit um you get that um you know aromatic just it, it, it's 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 bold and in your face um, you know, so for, for me, you know, uh, uh, living in Northern California, I've, I've, I've tried, uh, plenty of, uh, strains of marijuana. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but I just did. <laughs> you can, um, it's probably legal. Also, it's legal. So. <laughs> it's legal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but, uh, but, but I would say, you know, it, it's just got this just, uh, like in your face characteristic and, and like that, that dankiness literally like, like I was talking about the Zappa hop, that Zappa hop will actually deliver a little bit of like a kind of a cannabis type of characteristic to it for sure. Well, so. Zach, you want to join in? What What's dank to you? I mean, similar to what Terrence is saying, I mean, at this point, I think we're all familiar with the smell of what really dank weed smells like. And I think when I bring that up in any kind of a tasting class, people always chuckle, but it's the perfect descriptor. I think when you're talking about beer, and I, similar to you, Jimmy, I spent some time in the wine world as well. And, and I kind of had my lexicon of describing stuff shaped by that. Um, the beer world is so much more open when it comes to being able to talk about stuff. So I always, and everyone always says this, but like, you got to talk the talk and walk the walk. I always try to tell people that like, you got to use the words that come to you right away. Otherwise it's going to sound polished out to the point where it doesn't really matter so if you like you said like you don't have to be like wow this is booming with tropical fruit but if you get a little bit of it mention it and you come back to it too like second sip third sip fourth sip over time i always talk to people like don't you know don't review the film in the first 20 minutes you know like let things kind of play out and think it through and if you're you know lucky enough you'll you'll walk away having had a different last sip than you would have first so i think uh i think talking about beer is something that we're getting more comfortable doing as an industry. Um, I mean, there's always that fine line of like, you don't want to alienate people by throwing out really crazy adjectives. But I think um, being uh, being aware of, of the fact that people want to hear some of these descriptors, it makes them feel comfortable in a lot of ways. Uh, it should be something that we, we kind of embrace and talk about more. Yeah. And hey, Ted, I uh, want to bring you back in. Um, t tell us about what you think of Sierra Nevada when, 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 when you think about it. Um, any favorites that they have? Any things that you're regularly selling at Top Hops? Well, <clears throat> I mean, Sierra Nevada is like you know the the, uh, the gateway, <laughs> the gateway to craft for, for for the vast majority of people. Especially if you if you got into craft when most of us got into craft, you know, uh, twenty years ago. Um, the uh, the I'm I'm really looking forward to <laughs> listening to this description of Dank. Uh, I'm really looking forward to trying this beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Torpedo, and uh, but I'm, I'm really a big fan of Celebration. And uh, at this time of year, uh, you know, I like the fresh hop beers, and there aren't as many of them available on the East Coast anymore. Um, when there's with the with the real rise in local, um, there's been a lot less uh, stuff coming out from the West Coast, and we don't get as much uh, you know fresh hop beer here on the East Coast. So I'm really looking forward to this year's celebration. Um, yeah, there's a, uh, and you know, like now that we're getting into the nice cooler weather, which is kind of the weather I'm built for and, and, and really like, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, some Bigfoot again this year. 
Oh, wow. And Terrence, uh, what about the fresh hop beers? I've had both the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Um, th those are like super specialty stuff that you guys make, right? Yeah, the, the Northern Hemisphere um, was, was, you know, what, what we started with. And that was uh, that was a beer that there was a, a hop broker, uh, Gerard Lemons. He was from uh, the U.K., and he had talked about uh, some brewers that he knew that had played with fresh hops right out of the field. They just happened to butt up right to a field. And so we call it wet hops. And that's what he referred to it as. And so Northern Hemisphere is a beer that we make every year. And this year we actually changed it up a little bit. We did 100%. It's, it's usually the same recipe as Celebration Ale, but just with wet hops where Celebration Ale is – this year's harvest but dried and kilned and brought to the brewery as soon as possible when we start brewing with it so that's the only difference between those two beers historically although this year what we did was we wanted northern hemisphere to come out a little bit sooner and there's a there's a harvest window for different varieties of hops so, uh, centennial hops happen to to come out about two weeks before cascades start to get harvested. And we really like, because so Northern Hemisphere, what we were doing to try to get the optimum harvest window is we brew one batch 100% Centennial, one batch 100% Cascade, blend them together, and then come out with the beer. What we found when we were drinking them in sensory was, man, that Centennial is amazing. Uh, and it would come out two weeks earlier and wouldn't have to compete with Celebration every single year. Um, so what we we made the plan this year to do 100% Centennial on the Northern Hemisphere. Cascade is the same recipe it's been since the day I started there 20, 26 years ago. Um, Cascade Centennials, um, probably if you had to look at percentages, probably 60% Cascade and 40% Centennials. Um, and that's that's what we call a fresh hop IPA because it's using 100% the harvested year's hops. Two of my all-time favorites, uh, Southern Hemisphere um, has actually been discontinued. Uh, that That is one of those brands I want to um, bring back and I want to bring it back to e-commerce. We have a lot of old styles and old brands of beer um, that we still get harped on by a lot of our social media followers of bring back Glissade, bring back Ruthless Rye, bring back, um, you know, the red wheat, uh, bring back Southern Hemisphere. And, and so these are things that we can do and uh, make small volumes and, and ship them out to the people that really want them. You yeah, know, so Ter mean, Terrence, how does that work exactly? So you'd make s small batches and put them on the e-commerce Yep. Yep. It would be, um, you know, uh, right now we're kind of looking at some other, other ways of doing it, but, um, as a brewer, we, we can only ship out to, um, roughly about, uh, I think it's nine States, eight or nine States right now. Uh, we can ship to California. We can ship to, uh, from our North Carolina brewery to North Carolina. Uh, but it's very limited, uh, you know, Alaska, Hawaii, North Dakota, um, man, our sales are going through the roof in North Dakota. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyways, uh, Vir Virginia and, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a few, uh, like I said, there's, uh, uh, almost two handfuls of, uh, states we can send to. And so that's, that's what we would do. Um, maybe we, would, we, we would rely on, uh, our consumers to, uh, trade which i'm not supposed to say that either but yeah hey, hey terrence <laughs> let, let's just go back way to the beginning what was your first job at sierra nevada and and how many years ago was that i was uh 19 may 1994 um i was asked to come on board and be uh the first graveyard brewer so when we went to uh 24 hours seven days a week i would be that brewer that uh worked through the night um and really it wasn't 24 hours seven days a week it was 24 hours uh seven and uh two-thirds of a week 
uh, or six six and two thirds of a week. Uh, I would I would close down. I would I would brew graveyard Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. I would get off graveyard eight hours later. I'd brew on Saturday. I'd get off eight hours, come back on Sunday, and set the alarms. Uh, and then I, I was twenty six years old, and as I always say, I was a pig in shit because. <laughs> uh, I got all, I got all, I got all the beer I could drink. Um, and, uh, I got off at noon on Sunday and I didn't have to be back at work until eight o'clock on Wednesday night. So I could, uh, sounds like a bartender's life. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally, totally, wow. totally. But uh, well, 20- God, this, this, this has been great. Um, I want to get Ted, you, you want to say anything else before we close out? Well, one of the other things that we're working on with our with the e-commerce is uh, we're doing a, a subscription where uh, every other week we send out a six pack of beer to our, to our subscribers. I pick out uh, the six pack each week, and we're we're doing it. Um, we're trying to balance it out. We definitely want to have one or two uh, things that have just released that week from local brewers, so stuff that uh, is really special. Really can't keep your you know your hands on. Uh, balance it out with different styles, but I also want to uh, uh, take it because there's a lot of newer people that are into craft beer that haven't had a lot of the uh, the classics, and so I want to start including uh, classics in that uh, subscription beer as well. So we're going to be getting in, you know, the uh, the pale ale and and uh, you know some other some other old like you know maybe Stone IPA and some other things that are that some people might overlook now. Some of the newer people to craft beer. No, that, that's really important. And Zach, anything else that you want to add? Oh, I'm just glad I got to sit down and talk with you guys. That it's it's through all this craziness, it's been really good to touch base with people in the industry. And it still sounds, given all the craziness and then the sadness and that stuff out there, it's like good to hear the jovial vibes that are still with it, inherent to this industry. So um, I'm just looking forward to the next few months that uh, hopefully more news, more good news down the line, and that we could uh, hopefully resume this like we used to down at Roberta's and, and have a beer in person. So next time we do this, we'll, we'll actually cheers physically. That's great, man. Thanks, Zach. And Terrence, so uh, so is the Oktoberfest online still going on at Sierra Nevada? Can I order uh, I, I, the I think kits? It, or? I, I think you can order the kits, but uh, they're probably ramping down about now um, as we're moving into Celebration Ale uh, season. So um, – you can certainly go on there and try to try to find it or uh, contact us. And uh, if there's anybody out there and wants to throw a late Oktoberfest party, go for it. Uh, well, I'm making, pot, I'm making pot roast and spetzel this weekend. Right. <laughs> right. Drink it Why with not? The thankful. How about that? Right. Yeah. And, and, and again, uh, Zach and Ted, send me a link. I, I need to get some uh, New York beers out here. It's been, uh, it's been a few years since I've been out there uh drinking everything uh that's offered out there i gotta tell you new york is uh my favorite city to visit uh love love going out there and uh i used to i used to go out to all the allman brothers speaking shows so that was one of my wow. uh, one of my <laughs> highlights good, yeah well, listen you guys are great and i'm give a shout out one of our uh, friendly good beer seal bars is uh the pony bar dan mclaughlin i know he's always been a big supporter of sierra nevada the time yes, i met Ken Grossman and Brian Grossman, uh, they did a release. I think it was the um, that special Goza about four or five years ago. Yeah, it could have been. It, yes, it was. It was the Otrevez, um, and I think they were out there for beer camp and other stuff. But um, yeah, so yeah, you guys have been great. Th- thanks for joining us on the show. I'm going to give a big shout out. Thanks to Terrence, Ted, and Zach. Uh, thank you to our producer Dylan Hoyer and our engineer Amanda Wang. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. 
You can also find us at facebook.com slash Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.